Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report, getting an update from Silvercrest Metals. We're going to be talking about the recent Q4 and 2023 annual results where the company beat guidance in terms of sales and more importantly, I think corporate all-in sustaining costs as we have seen a lot of producers in the metal sector run hot on their costs basis. We are chatting with Chris Ritchie president of Silvercrest Metals. Silvercrest is traded on the TSX under the symbol SIL and on the NYSE under the symbol SILV. Now, Chris, let's start off with more the share price reaction on the back of those financial results released on March 11th. We saw the share price, which was already in an uptrend throughout early March, really move higher on the back of these results and traded a huge amount of volume. You've been on the show talking about some of the short positions within the stock. Was a lot of that pop in your eyes, do you think, due to short covering? Yeah, thanks. We've not seen a lot of fundamental capital flow to the space recently. The disconnect between the equities and the gold price is, is near historic highs. So to see close to $50 million across both markets come into the stock in one day when our typical trading volume is roughly $10 million per day, I definitely think that was a significant amount of short covering and, and probably a little profit taking on the sell side. But again, I think that was a healthy amount of short covering that was just caught off guard. Well, Chris, just in looking at the numbers, I think another reason you could have seen the stock pop was just uh, you're sitting in a pretty good position compared to a lot of the peers in the industry because you don't have a big debt overhang compared to a lot of other silver and gold producers. And you also have lowered your cost. Your ASIC was lower than expected and you got some pretty nice revenue. So maybe just speak to the health of the balance sheet and how that differentiates Silvercrest from a lot of companies that are still struggling. Yeah. And I think there's two components there. And one is definitely the balance sheet and the fundamentals. You know, our all-in sustaining cost came in at $12.58, which is below the low end of the of our guidance. And that's one of the lowest in the in the industry. That makes it extremely rare, which contributes to uh, a really healthy balance sheet. I think we were very fortunate with how we financed the company. We were um, our operations team executed well in the bill. We were on time on budget. And that meant we quickly paid off all of our debt. So again, in the, in the silver space, you know, the net debt of our peers has grown over 250% in the last three years while we're sitting on over 100 million of cash and bullion. So I, I think if you want to invest in gold and silver, but yet you're afraid of, of bad balance sheets, bad margins, execution risk, you know, the balance sheet also dovetails into people look at us, I think, as a bit of a safer vehicle to choose to invest in if you want that exposure. So I think one leads to the other. The healthy balance sheet and the fact that we're through the build uh, gives people more confidence that holding on to us for a rally is a safer place to park your money for this space. So Chris, we all know how much costs have been a focus for investors, for big and small producers. Look, we've already said here that the company beat the guidance for all in sustaining costs on a yearly basis. That came in at just over $12.50 per silver equivalent ounce. Now, look, we have seen costs continue to increase across the sector. Silvercrest is no different there. The guidance, which we did talk about on the last interview, for 2024, right in between $15 to 1590 How does the company go about constraining cost increases that the sector has seen sector-wide? I mean, part of this is just we're fortunate to have more gold and silver in each shovel full of dirt we dig up, right? If it costs something similar for everyone digging up a ton of dirt, um, if we've got twice as much gold and silver, it just reduces our unit costs. So, you know, what we spoke to on our conference call was given that costs tend to track the metal price, margins tend to stay fairly static. So if some other mine has 10% margins and we have over 60% margins, that advantage tends to be permanent. And again, that's an all else equal comment. Um, so our, our margins, uh, you know, I think are something that is, that is a, hopefully a resilient differentiator uh, in our peer group. In terms of moderating costs at the asset level ourselves, it's tricky. I mean, we're seeing labor go up across every industry, and we're no different. Our energy costs 
I think we're we're working really hard to get a solar contract in place for our power. And that means reducing our power costs. And that means locking in our power costs. So it's a hedge and a reduction in costs and also a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But it has to make sense business-wise for us to invest on the ESG front. So I, I don't see cost moderating a lot, to be honest. Uh, and that's, again, not a Silvercrest conversation. That's an every industry conversation. So the fact that we have the balance sheet and the margins in place, I think that advantage is going to stay really sticky for us. Well, Chris, maybe just tugging on that thread, having that cost confidence uh, or just the fact that you have some wiggle room with the margin and the revenues coming in and don't have the debt overhang. You also made a great point off mic, and I think it's worth reiterating here that when you put out your technical report last year, you already guided the market as to how things were going to look. And a lot of companies hadn't done that yet. And when we've seen their quarterly reports come in or their annual reports come in, there were some surprises to the downside with a lot of those companies. When you look at Silvercrest, how do you want people to think about the company as we move into 2024? Well, it, it starts off with us with having choices. The fact that we have a strong balance sheet and the margins in place allow us to sit down and put everything on the table and, and figure out what's the best thing we can do for our shareholders. And if you don't have a good balance sheet, you don't have margins, you're doing what you have to do. So I'll give you an example. One of the things we, we mentioned on our in our news release is we brought in a new contractor. And guess what? You know, the, the cost went up when we uh, redo our contracts. I mean, that's just the nature of the of the market. But our contractor has to get new equipment. And that equipment, you know, comes with equipment financing costs. We advanced them seven and a half million bucks because they were paying eight and a half percent on their equipment financing. We're saying, why would we pay eight and a half percent when we've got a whole bunch of cash? So seven and a half million bucks comes out of our bank account in Q1. But guess what? We're saving a million and a half dollars over the contract. So for us, it's those sorts of choices that allow us to save money over the medium and long term, you know, and it's the more prudent thing to do. Uh, as it relates to the technical report costs in general, we uh, anticipated in our technical report that our costs in 2024 would be $15 an ounce. And we got beat up pretty badly to put those numbers out into the market. Well, our guidance was that our costs were going to be between 15 and 15.90, so right in line. And why the 15.90? Well, we've got to ramp up our new contractors. So in case they have a, a challenge with labor or a piece of equipment doesn't get there in time, we just built in some wiggle room on the ASIC side in case in case there are some sort of growing pains with, uh, with that contractor. But our peers, who I guess were lucky enough not to have to put out a technical report mid-year last year, are having to sort of disclose the industry changes that we already disclosed. So we took our medicine with that and we took our hit with that. And I think what we're seeing is we came in in line with our tech report where the rest of the industry, for the most part, at least, is uh, showcased, you know, a lot higher costs, you know, balance sheet challenges. And I think that contributed to sort of the short interest is that there were a lot of companies that came out with bad costs in, in Q4. And people just, I think, assumed that safe to assume Silvercrest is going to have the same problem. And we were fortunate enough not to... Um, not to deviate from what we communicated in that technical report. Well, and that was a big news from last year was that technical report and the guidance that, yeah, the, the share price took a hit on the back of, but it is showing to be much in line with what we are seeing. And then looking into this year, simply from the cash management perspective, you ended 2023 with over $105 million in the bank, $86 million in cash with just over $19 million in bullion. You are still projecting to grow that cash throughout this year, 2024, but you will be paying taxes this year. So that cash build will be a bit on the lower end. What do you do with all this cash that's sitting on the balance sheet? That's a good question. So for us in H1, the fact that we're paying taxes now, and, we, and I hope everyone reads the news release to see what we communicated on the tax side. So, you know, the first half of the year, we actually don't expect the cash to grow that much because, you know, we're now entering the real world of tax payments. Um, but at gold and silver prices here with the margins we have, you know, a lot of these big one-time expenditures, the change in the contractor, and some of these one-time hits on the tax side are behind us in a, in a fantastic way. So what we hope to do with that cash is 
you know, continue to build it up. We hope to be adding more to the bullion. Uh, we view holding bullion as a way to allocate money towards the currency of choice for our investors while also maintaining it so that we can be opportunistic. You know, part of this is, you know, a lot of feedback, hey, give us a dividend, give us a dividend. Um, the challenge in mining is there's not many single asset companies that do that. Uh, if something does go wrong, you're not necessarily positioned to uh, fight off the problems and you're not able to be opportunistic. You know, there was a lot of people who did not want us to build the project during COVID. It's too risky. What are you doing and whatnot? But guess what? That was exactly the right time to do it when no one else wanted us to. So uh, for us, hopefully more bullion. We did renew our buyback. Um, and again, for us, the buyback is more about being opportunistic. If the stock ever gets beat up or, or weak again, those are the moments where we want to be buying. It's not a permanent structure and buy at all costs. But again, it's also something where we can return to the exploration. Um, that's something where we want to look to sort of grow value while we're waiting for that market to turn while reducing risk for our investors. Well, Chris, I think you make some great points that the cash and the bullion give you the optionality to be opportunistic, whether it's buying back shares or helping out your contractors, as you just mentioned, or just seizing opportunities when they come up. It gives you that flexibility. Uh, we've talked a lot about holding the bullion on the balance sheet, but it also ties into the macro picture that you have as far as the value of the metals that you're digging out of the ground. And I think you've made a great point in some previous calls that a lot of companies are so quick to sell their metal and trade it for currencies that are following and, and purchasing power. Give us an example of the macro picture as far as what you see for silver and for gold that makes you want to hold bullion on the balance sheet in the first place. Look, first and foremost, we believe in our product, right? We think it's quite crazy for people to get out of bed every day and go work their butts off to get gold and silver out of the ground just so they can hurry up and sell it. Like we believe in the product. We think it holds purchasing power uh, much, much better. And we think it's a governance obligation. You know, building a mine takes 15 to 20 years. So the first thing that we think we owe it to our investors to do is preserve the purchasing power of our money while we wait to reallocate it. If I came to you tomorrow and all the investors and said, I, have a, I need $500 million to build a project, a great project, will you invest? And let's say we get that $500 million. If one day later we say, guess what, we're going to postpone this, we're going to keep your 500 million, but we're going to build it 20 years from now. There's not a single person that would say, hold on, <laughs> I think that's a good use of the money over time or that it's going to cost you 500 million 20 years from now. Our industry sells a product that holds purchasing power better than the dollar to put it in a dollar to then run a business that requires really long cycles of time and our purchasing power is eroded. So first and foremost, we think it's a governance obligation to preserve our purchasing power. But second of all, gold just broke out. Silver has just broke out. Um, for us, we want to give our investors more exposure to the currency they want while reducing risk. At the same time, we want to reduce the supply in silver in the market. Like we think we're part of the problem as an industry to sell silver and gold below the true, true, true cost to get it out of the ground. We want to give our investors a better chance at making a positive return on invested capital and getting exposure to the upside in the metal and changing the way the industry does business. So to that point, since the company has so much cash on the balance sheet, the asset is built. Are you going to be increasing the bullion holdings this year at a greater rate? We hope so, but the reality is in H1, because of the tax, you know, are probably going to make that rate of change slower in the first half of the year or, or negligible in the first half. And the way we do this is we need to have a certain amount of cash on the balance sheet, a percentage of our free cash flow above and beyond that minimum cash balance is what we're allowed to add. So again, it just depends on the, on the pricing of the metal and whatnot. And for the first half of the year, it's probably going to be pretty flat unless we see the gold price keep moving and then we can keep inching it up. But what we have been able to do is actually earn a better income off of our bullion writing, writing a covered call strategy. So the income that we're making while we wait is better income than we're making off of our treasuries and uh, you know, our GICs and the like. So again, we're making a better return while we make while holding it. 
and the big the big thing we're hoping is that investors say I like this approach. You know, we're going to hold a few shares in Silvercrest to encourage them to keep going. And if that message gets out and we get rewarded for trying to hold back supply, trying to increase the price, try to give the investors more exposure with less risk, if we can change the way that the industry thinks about this topic, we can truly, truly change the economics of the industry, make this industry more, more healthy, uh, and it will help every producer. If every producer can benefit from a higher metal price, then we want to do our part, and we hope everyone sees that. Yeah, Chris, I think it's an honorable uh, approach, and I hope that more companies adopt the similar strategy, especially if you can prove it out that, hey, it's working for Silvercrest, maybe more companies fall in line and do the same thing and hold back some of the supply and allow the valuation to increase. But you mentioned that the extra cash and bullion also give you the optionality to look at things like expiration. I think it'd be nice to point out there still is a lot of expiration upside that Silvercrest has on your land package. Why don't you speak to the expiration blue sky upside that the company has to put some of those funds into expiration? Yeah, that's, and that's a great point. Just like holding metal, allocating money to exploration is a choice. Uh, and what the industry is getting right now is over $20 an ounce are people's costs. Exploration is a cost on top of that. And if they find ounces that are in new areas, there's extra capital uh, on top of that. So there's a lot of companies that are investing capital with a negative return uh, for exploration. So for us, because we have the margins, we've got uh, a really good shot at, at making a positive uh, return of capital with our exploration. Now, the reality is, is recently, uh, when, you, when you create an engineering design to access certain parts of the mine, and if you don't access those parts in the next one to two years, uh, we can't go back, right? We're mining. Things are moving quickly. So we've been focused on areas in and around the existing mine plan, right around the edges and whatnot, so that you, you know, we don't use it or lose it. So what we've seen so far is stuff that's kind of marginal, but it's additive. It's stuff that you know, we're already there. We can add it to the mine plan. So a lot of that has been time-sensitive work um, that's been in and around existing mine plans and design and in and around areas where we've already spent the capital or already planned to spend the capital. That is our best bang for the buck. Might not be the sexiest, uh, but that is the best bang for a buck for the best return for our investors. At the same time, we're now able to get through the year end and go back to, let's look at for new stuff. That's, that's the stuff that can really move the needle if we find new ounces that's just above and beyond what we have today. And that drops right to the bottom line pretty quickly. And then the third wave is, you know, let's look regionally. Take longer, cost a little bit more money. But if we can find some stuff regionally that can be put on a truck and driven over to our current plant, guess what? We don't need to build a new plant. So that's a lot of leverage we get for capital already spent. If you build a new mine from scratch, that's a lot of new capital that needs to be spent. So again, risk-adjusted returns is the main focus. Um, and we're kind of full steam ahead on that exploration work with, again, the near-term stuff is more the what we must do to be efficient uh, around the current mine plan. So plugging away on that, having more time for that, um, which we're glad for, and <laughs> it does take time. Look, Chris, I'm going to post a couple of links below this interview. One to that recent news that outlines the 2023 financial results and also to our last interview at the tail end of February where we dove into the 2024 guidance, including that exploration budget of 12 to $14 million. We went into a little bit more detail on all of that, including the guidance. And for everyone listening, if you have any follow-up questions after reading over the news, you want Chris to elaborate on any points, please email me and I'll get Chris to address those in our next call. Chris, thank you very much for taking time to update all of our listeners. We'll chat again soon. Thank you very much for having me.